Welcome to another episode of our Personal Empowerment Audio Series, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is entitled Narrow Awake, or subtitled What's Wrong with Wide Awake? And simply said, what's wrong with Wide Awake is it just keeps getting wider and wider. There's so much stuff to deal with right now that living in this wide awake state is so confusing that it feels dangerous. It seems counterintuitive, but what Steve and I are going to explain today is the way multitasking and being wide awake, that is, trying to expand the amount of information that you bring in and that you process and trying to increase and improve your output, your performance, actually... Well, there's a point of diminishing return where the more wide awake you are and the more that you try to process, the worse you do. It's a little like sports psychology where we came to understand about 30, 35 years ago that trying too hard degraded your performance in sports. We now know that's true in academics and a lot of other areas too. So this is sort of like that. You've got to find that balance point in the middle and sometimes it tends toward being really relaxed, and sometimes it tends toward multitasking and getting a lot done. But wider and wider awake does not mean better and better and better. There is a place in between unconscious or asleep on one end of things and wide awake in the other, and that's what we call narrow awake. That's our theme today. The concept of focused concentration on only one thing, you know, at a time. This wide awake thing, you know, picture somebody who's standing there and their eyes are getting wider and wider open, you know, because there's more and more. It's like, it's like moving into panic kind of thing. Wider and wider awake. This whole concept of dealing with so much data is really pretty new to the human being. I mean, you know, considering that as little as a couple of few hundred years ago, most people couldn't read. I mean, as little as a couple of few hundred years ago, most people spent most of their days, well, uninspired people spent their days in boredom, punctuated by moments of high anxiety, and inspired people spent their days in fascination and wonder and awe, punctuated by moments of high anxiety. But, but like being in a state of, oh my God, there's so much happening, was a once in a while thing. It wasn't a lifestyle. And that's what we're talking about when we say wide awake. There's, there's so much happening in my life. There's just too much to handle as a lifestyle is just not somewhere we want to be. There are moments we need to be wide awake. But what we're saying here is that there are many, many times during the course of a day when it's much more important to be narrow awake, when it's most important to make a decision or to do some disciplining of children or to choose a goal or to motivate yourself to take that next step. When the outcome counts or when you're trying to do something important or understand something important, that's not the time to be wide awake. That's the time to take your mind and totally fixate it like a laser beam and make it extremely narrow awake. That's what we're talking about is focus. I remember as a young child learning for the first time about laser beams. They were very new in the late 50s and early 60s. And a phrase I'll always remember from my attempt to understand it, though you don't hear it much anymore, is coherent light. The idea that somehow light could be generated in parallel waves so that you didn't try to focus it like the way a headlight with a parabolic reflector attempts to focus, you actually could create parallel or coherent. That's like uh, almost cohesive. You, you know, it hangs together. So a laser beam that's maybe a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, you shoot it to the moon and maybe it only expanded to about an eighth of an inch by the time it got all the way to the moon. Well, that's where the power is. And now light focused like that, like a laser beam, can be used to cut steel, or to do the most delicate operations. I've had laser treatments in my eye. A lot of people have had laser surgery in their eyes and in other places. I heard the other day, my brother was talking about this, that there are laser beams that are smaller than a single cell, so that when they're used in place of surgical instruments, a, a surgical knife, they're cutting only one cell wide. Wow. That's pretty focused. Well, what if we could do that with the mind on demand so that, yeah, we can still go unconscious for about a third of the day and, and we can multitask and 
keep all the balls in the air and all the plates spinning for some of the day. But the in between, asleep and wide awake, this narrow awake place is the power that we can apply in a variety of areas. And we're going to talk about some of the ways of getting into that level of mind, narrow awake, and then applying that focused attention, focused passion, we call it. Yeah, it's focusing your passion. Because if you focus without passion, you go from one focus to another focus to another focus, there's nothing to hold you on that focus. It's the passion that keeps you from straying from what you're focused on. So bring the focus, that is, point the laser-beamed mind at the thing that you want, and then bring to bear the emotion, the passion, the joy, the excitement, the enthusiasm with it as well. That's what keeps the mind there. Now, this... This narrow awake state is a a wonderful place to do two really basic things. One is to discover things about yourself, and number two is to develop yourself. That is to, to go inside and find out Oh, like the answers to the questions like what do I want or what are my gifts, talents, and abilities or uh, what's the right choice for me to make in this circumstance. And also, when you do know what you want, to go in and imagine what you want as if you've already got it over and over again with great passion to, to program the mind to begin to get it. Those are the kinds of things you can do in this narrow awake state. But it's really important to understand that you can get into the state in a moment with just sort of the decision to deciding, okay, I want to focus my mind now. Focus is your mind. I mean, just the thought, right now, I'm going to put myself into a focused state. Put your mind into that focused state. You just stopped multitasking. You just stopped doing everything else. But to me, all my life, I mean, for over 50 years now, the way that I really bring it home, that I'm paying attention to only one thing now, is to pay attention to one slow, conscious, deep breath. That's such an easy way And breathing is one of those things that you usually do on autopilot, but you know you can do consciously, purposely, anytime you want. Anytime you breathe on purpose and pay attention to the doing that, you have stopped all the other things that you're doing because that's all that you're doing. We really need to redefine the word trance as an example, as an illustration of what we're talking about. Because most people think, well, when you get really relaxed, if, if you meditate or contemplate or some skilled guide hypnotizes you, or you do self-hypnosis, that this state of relaxed focus is a kind of a trance where you are less aware and less alert and under the control of the hypnotherapist or the psychologist or whatever, uh, none of which is true. It's the wide-awake state where we're overstimulated, overwhelmed, where we go into a kind of a daze or a trance. And that what we've traditionally thought of as the trance is the narrow awake state. So that we're more awake in narrow awake and more in trance in wide awake sounds confusing. I know, maybe even backwards to you, but I think we got to really challenge the whole idea of what's the trance? Yeah, because trance is a strange kind of word. There is a state like sleepwalking, you know, like really, really, really close to totally unconscious. Some nambulism. Some nambulism. Right. That is a trance-like state. But, you know, the real trance, as you said, is like walking around through life not thinking, walking around through life thinking the thoughts that other people put in your mind without thinking for yourself. And narrow awake takes those other people's thoughts and puts them on hold for the moment and gets you in touch with your thoughts, with the you that we like to talk about being the higher self, the, the part of you that's aware of the fact that you have thoughts and you have feelings and you have a body and you have possessions and you have this whole habit pattern that you know of how you behave. But, you know, you are not any of those things, you are the awareness of the fact that you're all of those things and more. And that's one of the things that comes to you when you take that one conscious, slow, deep breath and go out of the beta brainwave state, which is technically divided attention, multitasking, many thoughts at the same time, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between thoughts and feelings, down to this alpha brainwave state, which starts at that place where you're just thinking one thought, but it can take you down into a state that people think of as being a trance, you know, a a, a kind of deeper level. But anywhere in there where the mind is just doing one thing at a time, 
it's totally focused on one thing at a time and your emotions are engaged in that thing. That's the narrow awake state we're talking about. And that's a powerful state. It's a hyper-suggestible state. It's a powerfully introspective state. It's where the aha, the intuition comes through. It's that narrow awake state is really the, the, the magical place we need to spend much more time. I remember you, you used to uh, use a metaphor a long time ago how, the, like, we live in a building with a basement and a roof. You know, the basement is sleep and the roof is, like, stress, and we hardly ever go in the building, the place in between. Well, this is the building. This is the place in between the basement and the roof. Much less get off the elevator and walk around on the floor and explore in that dimension, too. Yeah, so the idea that... This narrow awake state is a two-way street I want to develop. But again, let me state one more time. Deal with the apparent contradiction, or at the very least paradox, that to really wake up, you have to move in the direction of sleep. Just a little bit of the way, but you do have to go that way. It's like the teeter-totter. you got to find, or maybe better, uh, tuning a... a a lever and fulcrum kind of a system. Where do I put the fulcrum? Because it's not always in the middle. Depends on the job. You might have to put it closer to the object you're prying or farther away. And tuning that middle spot is what we're talking about. Where is the middle? Well, it, it might vary a little bit. But just know that you clearly can't do your best when you're asleep or even drowsy. And now we're reminding you, because I think you already know if you think about it, that you're not going to do your best when you're so wide awake that you're overstimulated and stressed out. So to find that middle and to have the skills we're going to talk about, the breathing, the letting go of muscular tension, ah, quieting the mind, moving to paradise, that's what we call it. That's that narrow awake place where you can do, as Steve already said, two basic things. You can receive and you can send. You can sit open and receptive to the questions about what I want and what should I do. And then when you do set goals and desired outcomes and can visualize in your mind's eye the results you'd like to attain, you can use the same place of narrow awake, the alpha brainwave level. It's about 10 cycles per second. In brainwaves, it's a real empirical place to visualize the goal or the outcome or the solution. Now, taking a deep breath is only one of the ways to create the narrow awake state. There's lots and lots of other ways to do it, too. Any kind of ritual that you create, a mantra in meditation or in hypnosis. I, I used to do a thing where I would do this uh, feel heavy and then roll my eyes up in my head, you know, and, and as I rolled my eyes up in my head, that, that's what happens when you fall into a deep sleep state. So when you roll your eyes up in your head, your brain triggers like some sleep stuff and it help, helps make your body relax. There's all kinds of ways, but the, the way that Michael and I have often talked about it in, in recent times is it's entering a place of personal paradise. This narrow awake state is a paradise place. It's a place where you feel like you're in a beautiful place that you've created in, inside your mind, but more more than beautiful, it's a safe place. Yeah, that's the deal. That's really the key. That You see, narrow awake is only possible when you feel safe because the less safe you feel, the more wide awake you need to be. And if you're totally in danger, your eyes have to be really wide and wide. The key to wide, wider and wider awake is less and less safe. We get wider and wider awake when there's more and more stuff that's confusing and feels dangerous just because it's overwhelming. It's not really dangerous, but it feels dangerous. So we get narrower and narrower awake when there's less stuff out there that could be dangerous to us and we feel safer and safer. When we feel totally safe, that's when we move into this state of of narrow awake. Now, totally safe. Literally, we feel totally safe all the time we're sleeping. We feel totally safe. Occasionally in a dream, we don't. But it's not impossible for the human being for moments at a time, not in a whole life 24-7, but at any given time, it's not only possible, it's relatively easy to feel totally safe. All you need to do is convince your brain that you are, and you do that every time you take a real slow, deep breath, close your eyes, and let go of muscular tension. Anytime you convince your brain that fight or flight is not going to be necessary right about now, we can let go of all those needs to jump on stuff, and we can just have that sigh of relief throughout our whole body. Anytime we can do that, then we move into that narrow awake state, that place where we feel safe, and that place we call paradise, where you can do what we like to call paradise thinking, essentially coming from that part of your mind that 
never worries, never is upset or angry, never is scared, because it knows that the only real danger is, you know, clear and present life-threatening stuff, and it knows your autopilot will kick in if, if that's there. So if the voice inside, when you close your eyes and go to paradise, has any nervousness or anxiety in it or any tension or any apprehension or any, any fear in it, it's not, that's not the voice. Take one more breath then and listen for the voice that just radiates being safe. See, there's really two minds beside the conscious mind that wakes up in the morning and falls asleep at night. And it sounds like that's basically what we're talking about. But there is this other aspect of mind. It's pretty obvious. It's the part that breathes you and keeps your heart beating while you're asleep or unconscious that continues to digest food and fight disease and repair and replace cells. It's quite a miraculous aspect of mentality, this subconscious mind, but by its very function, subconscious. It it suggests inferior to. It doesn't really mean that at all. Quite the contrary. In many ways, it's a superior mind, but it is submerged. It is below, somehow, the conscious threshold. And yet, when you come to paradise thinking, this alpha brainwave level, narrow awake, as we're calling it today, you get access to that subconscious mind. You can really become aware of a part of being, of thinking and feeling and and choices in your behavior and your actions that is there all along, but which we lose access to when we're wide awake and overstimulated. And this subconscious mind is powerful stuff. I mean, this is memory this is emotions, this is uh, big picture thinking, this is the, the whole autonomic autopilot system, this is creativity and imagination. This is everything that isn't whatever you're seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, tasting, touching, and thinking right now. <laughs> it's everything else. And, and we, we gain access to all of that stuff much, much more intensely when we exit wide awake and enter the world of narrow awake. When we take that deep breath, when we close our eyes, when we go to paradise, then what happens is we open up a filter between the conscious and subconscious minds. It's called a lot of different things. Uh, it's like a screen, a semi-primeral membrane, an osmotic shield. Technically, it's called the uh, reticular activating system, but it's essentially something that it's not steady states. It's like a filter that opens and closes depending upon your level of brainwave activity. The more stressed you are, the tighter the filter closes. Like trying to remember something in that uh, tip of the tongue kind of thing, the, the harder you remember, the, the harder you try, the tighter the filter closes, and then relaxing and letting it go, and then the filter opens and you remember. So this filter opens and closes. And as we uh, feel safe and don't need access to our strength and speed, our fight or flight, then this filter opens and we gain access to creativity and, and, and wisdom and intelligence and intuition and ingenuity and insight and that amazing subconscious mind, the, the land through which uh, we experience the world of narrow awake. Now, one of the most important principles in all of this, and it has so many different names, that's what's difficult or challenging to us here to explain. We can call it the law of suggestion or suggestibility that, you know, most of us tend to believe what we're told. Now, there are other variables. How credible is the source? How many other times have we heard it? Have we done the research? Uh, Have we invoked that second level of critical thinking where we ask ourselves, Why do I believe what I feel like I believe? Those kinds of concepts are much easier to take action on, to employ in your life when you understand these principles of suggestion. And central to all of it is that the subconscious mind does not distinguish between real and imagined. Now, you've got to let that sink in for a little bit. The conscious mind, that's its primary job. The willpower, the conscious mind, it decides what's real and what's just a dream. But the subconscious mind is the imagination. Its only job is to dream. To dream in a receptive way, and when you do know what you want, to help you magnetize it by dreaming in a sense of projection. It's like receiving and being causative. It's a two-way street, as we said before. But The imagination just doesn't really second-guess 
the willpower or the conscious mind. It doesn't say, are you sure that's real? Are you sure we can do that? It just dreams it up. And when we're at cross purposes, for example, when we want something, but we have some sort of internal dialogue that says, you can't have that. You can't do that. You don't have a degree. You're not properly educated. What would people think? <laughs> There's a curious one. What would people think? And then we get at cross purposes. So here we're dreaming of what we do want, but we're also dreaming, if you will, and imagining what we don't want. And that just creates a wider and wider and wider awake state. But in narrow awake, in this alpha brain wave level, like 8 to 12 cycles per second, 10 cycles plus or minus, this is where everything is most finely tuned and calibrated. And a single suggestion, whether it's verbal, whether it's a picture, and especially if it's reinforced by a passion, whether real or imagined, tends to be experienced as real enough to the subconscious, and it begins to prepare to receive that desired goal or outcome. I mean, it's just the same as when you go to a movie theater and you suspend judgment. You know, you know, part of you knows it's just a movie, but it doesn't matter because when, like, when the scary person comes out, you jump in your seat. You know, the subconscious mind doesn't make any distinction between real and imaginary. So when you move into this narrow awake state, what you can do is you can ask your mind what you want. And then when you know the answer to that question by listening, then you can tell yourself to get it by imagining what you want, rehearsing it in your mind over and over and over again. This is a really powerful technique. You can call it hypnosis or meditation or biofeedback or neuro-linguistic programming or creative visualization or practical daydreaming was a name you once put to it. But whatever name you want to put on it, to me, this is like, okay, I'm going to take charge of my life now. I'm not going to just be a victim of my thoughts and feelings. I'm going to choose which feelings some thoughts I'm going to go with. I'm going to let go of the ones I don't want. And, and, you know, there's really only two things you need to do, I think, to stay in a narrow awake state much of the time in your life. To, to deal with the two basic stress causes of your life, the, the chronic cause of stress and the acute cause of stress. The, the acute, the in the moment cause of stress in your life is when you have a negative thought and you... <gasps> freak out when you and your negative thought scares you when you have a, a, a worry thought or an anxiety feeling and it scares you and you stop breathing or you start breathing shallower or you start tightening your muscles and all day long we have these negative thoughts or we see these negative things and we ne think negative things and, and we tighten up well when we do that that sort of raises our blood pressure for a moment that that squirts some adrenaline that makes the amygdala go danger danger so deal with that deal with that by changing your mind by Focusing on those moments in your life when those things happen and choose instead to respond. Instead of knee-jerk react, choose to respond by uh, one deep breath. You take a deep breath and that thought loses all of its power to scare you. Literally, all the power that thought had to scare you was in its ability to make you tighten up and hold your breath. If, if that thought causes you to... Uh, relax and it, it loses its power to scare you that's that's really the key and then the higher self knows it doesn't need to be scared of that thought it doesn't need to be scared of anything that's not really dangerous and that's not really dangerous so one of the keys to staying out of stress is to listen to your thoughts and feelings when you have a negative thought or a negative feeling breathe you know instead of holding your breath breathe practice 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 and it'll start happening automatically and the other thing you have to do to you know, live a life that's free of most of the stress, at least, is, is because stress does build. It's a, it's a building thing. It's a, you know, every, from the morning when you wake up, you know, there's traffic and there's, and there's deadlines and there's, and there's uh, stupid people and there's people who make bad decisions and careless mistakes and wreck your life. And then there's all that stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, stress builds. So what you need is a stress release mechanism, a stress release valve. And we call that finding yourself in paradise. The idea of taking responsibility for your life is, it seems to me, largely about finding control. And it often amazes me how many of us spend as much time as we do seeking to control events and circumstances uh, and, and people, obviously, out there, as if we could control what's being done to us. It's so much easier to come into a place of narrow awake when you understand that real control is how you look at it and what you do with it. That life is what you make it. It's not about controlling or managing other people and trying to 
influence what's being done to you, good luck with that. If you can persuade or influence, that's a good thing. Seduce, cajole, buy off <laughs> whatever <laughs> leverage you've got. But it doesn't brilliant. work that great in some circumstances. No, many. It does, yeah. no, it just, and, and so to look at the fact that we do have response ability, the ability to control how we look at it, that's point of view, perspective, that's your response in the response ability, how you look at it. And you do have control over how you respond to it so you're safe in these areas, right? Now, realizing that, bringing that to mind and making that kind of thought and that attitude habitual. See, the PowerPoint really is in the middle there between stimulus and response. The attitude, managing your attitude in the middle. That's where you say, as Steve just indicated, wait a minute, I want to drive the boat or the bus or the, or the plane. I want to be in the driver's seat. I, I mean, aren't you tired of being a victim of life? And the only sense of power many people have is in their attempts at sympathy, this pity party, appealing to other people to feel sorry for us. We, we want love. Too often we seek sympathy instead. It's not the same thing. And what passes for conversation often is individuals petitioning each other for sympathy because we are such helpless victims and there's nothing I can do about it. Be the person that takes a slow, deep breath, lifts your head, put your shoulders back, open up that rib cage, take another nice, slow, deep breath, and talk about what you are going to initiate in response to the situation in which you find yourself. To initiate your goals, your solutions, your dreams, your desired outcomes. That, to me, is personal responsibility. Forget this attempt to make it a political position. Now, you're either a socialist or you're personally responsible. You can be a personally responsible socialist or an irresponsible capitalist. It, let's not conflate these ideas and make personal responsibility some sort of partisan issue. I see that way too much. It's not about being on your own. It's about finding your personal power and expressing it in the best way possible. The more you can bring this narrow awake moment into your life, this narrow awake state, the more powerful your life becomes. For example, if you're real stressed and you're having dinner, you can go all the way through the dinner without that one narrow awake moment of, wow, this is amazing spaghetti. I mean, when you stop and taste the food, and that's all you're doing at that moment, taste the food, smell the roses, you know, stop and Honor the person you're sitting with and appreciate in the moment the, with gratitude the, the way that person has been for you. That's a narrow awake moment. When you let go of all the other stuff and you just notice one thing that grabs you, that grabs your heart, that grabs your attention. Well, what we're saying is, yeah, life gives you those moments. There's wake-up calls. There's moments that happen. You know, the, the spaghetti is so darn good you had to stop and notice it. But, but in any given meal, you can stop and take a narrow awake moment. In any given experience, you can choose to bring all of you to bear to acknowledging, appreciating, exploring, experiencing the moment, the, the now, the, the beautiful, magnificent now. One of the synonyms for narrow awake, of course, is paying attention. I've always thought, Steve, that was a funny phrase, to pay attention. I'm not sure it's derivation, but uh, you talked about grabbing attention or something grabbing your attention, for example. And so there is that holding on again. But the truth is that I've come to think of attention as being a tension, away from or Excellent. other than yeah. tension. In other words, to pay attention, the problem I have with pay is it sounds like an effort or grabbing. It sounds And like, like you'll have less after it's done. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be taxed on right. that. Oh, not the attention bailout. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it, the key point here is attention comes not from effort, but by letting go of effort. Feeling that's, so, that's so significant. I remember as a kid, I used to think concentrate means, <laughs> yeah. and I came to realize concentrate means, <sighs> yeah. So huge. That's constipate. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you were close. 
Concentration is letting go. How many people have gone all the way through school and had a much more difficult time than they would have had if somebody had just said, concentration or paying attention is a relaxation skill? Right. Not a create tension. It's a tension, against tension, anti-tension. <sighs> concentration comes when your mind feels safe enough to pay attention to only one thing. When your mind is feeling endangered, it's got to look to the left, to the right, behind you, in front of you, all over the place. But when it feels safe, it can zoom in to just one single thing. That's what the narrow part is, you know. Like the flashlight beam can go from the wide angle to the zoom angle, you know. And that's what you can do with your mind. And with each slow breath you take, with each moment you spend not feeling stressed and endangered, You have an opportunity in this narrow awake state to do some really, really wonderful and special things. But just spending time there in a place like we call paradise, just spending time really feeling safe, just just being narrowly awake and paying attention only to the fact that here I am, I'm safe. You know, this is if if no other time during the day except when I'm asleep. Now I'm 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 safe and I'm aware of the fact that I'm safe. That's just so healthy for mind, body, and spirit. That's just so healthy, finding yourself in paradise. And, you know, some of the coolest stuff happens when you're there because, I, you know, you, as you like to say, you find the best parts of yourself in places you were afraid to look. You bet. This, in many ways, Steve, is, is a classic less is more kind of a concept. I have to share the story. You've probably heard it. It's like supposedly part of Americana folk wisdom of the indigenous people, the so-called American Indians, that they would build a small fire, get close, keep warm. And then they would look at the Europeans coming in and they'd say, white man, build big fire, keep warm running for wood. (laughs) (laughs) Narrow awake, you know, you don't need a big fire necessarily. You don't need to be wide awake and... And and your peak performance does not come from doing a lot at once. Usually less is more in the sense of being concentrated, feeling safe, uh, moving to that alpha brainwave place, 10 cycles or so. Okay, it's a very real place of narrow awake. And there you're focused and concentrated. Now you get close and keep warm. It's where you always are except when you're stressed, which unfortunately for so many people starts the moment they open their eyes and ends the moment they close it when they finally drop off to sleep. There are people who aren't stressed all the time, you know, but but there are people who are. I mean, well, some people are hooked on it. Uh, yeah. You know, it can feel exciting. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fear and excitement, as you know, because uh, we've taught whole workshops just on the idea of What is the difference between an oh no and an oh boy? It's easy to get confused and experience your stress as excitement, and then you get actually hooked on the adrenaline. You love it. And then how about another Red Bull and a few more cups of coffee on top of that, right? Boy, uh, you might think that you're getting ahead that way or that you're getting more done, but the truth is you're going to burn out pretty quickly and in the long run be a lot less productive in the quality of what you're doing is going to suffer too. Yeah, there's where the diminishing returns thing comes in. Because to a certain extent, more and more stress is bad. Bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, three and two counts. Some people are clutch and they, they perform better under pressure. Right. But, you know, there's a point at which it's too much and, and we don't do as well. That's a good example, Reggie Jackson and A-Rod. Like Reggie, if you go back that far, he was Mr. October. Boy, he was at his best under pressure. He really rose to the occasion. He loved it. You know, and a Rod's going to miss this October, I think. <laughs> well, I, they always said he's the guy that clutches in the in the pennant race, and and uh, a lot of people are great players as long as there's no pressure. They don't know how to again be personally response able, right? When when you're under pressure, all you have to do is work with the mind that you are training, and say. Yeah, we're under pressure, but we're not under danger. Nobody's going to kill us here. We're not going to die. And the best way to ensure the outcome we want is to uh, relax to that balance point. Now, if I get apathetic, (laughs) I'm going too far the other way, right? Or if I'm nodding off, uh, getting drowsy, you've gone too far the other way. This was the 
primary lesson of sports psychology about 40 years ago was you have to psych up, but again, there is that point of diminishing return where if you try harder and still harder and even harder, your performance is going to go right downhill. you got to find that balance point, that peak of the bell curve. And one of the best ways to find that place is to find yourself in paradise. So Notice the peak of that bell curve is the narrowest part of the curve, yeah. too. So that's, that's true. It's a nice visual for you. So you wanted to do an audio journey? I think it's time, you know. Uh, you know, focusing uh, the mind is an amazing thing to do. It's like you said, focusing light. You know, I heard uh, a TED talk the other day where they now have invented, this guy's invented where he can focus sound. Like you can point sound right at somebody and the person standing next to him can't hear it, you know, and you can whisper something in somebody's ear and they think that they heard it. You know, the downside, the cynical part of me says, I've got to tell you this, it's being used as a weapon. Yeah, probably. But it's going to be used more, I think, as, as you're walking by a, a store, it's going to talk right at you about the products that you need to buy. Well, that, it, that may know. be a weapon, too. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Who knows? A lot of new technology is used as a weapon, and, and then they justify, well, we've got to have war because that's where our new technology comes from. No, that's not the only place wonderful ideas come from. But, yeah, to be able to focus on. It's a very cool concept. I mean, it's really nice to think that you'll, I'll be able to sit and watch TV at my volume and not have to disturb my wife who's, you know, not wanting to hear the thing or wants to hear it lower. You know who's using that is the Japanese whalers against the environmentalists that are trying to stop the ooh, whaling. Ooh, yeah, they point it at them and drag. play heavy metal music through it. Real, real oh, let's do just the opposite of that. Let's, <laughs> let's go the other let's way. Let's go the other way. Let's go into from that wide awake place into a place of narrow awake, which always begins uh, with the intention. So is this the right time? If, it's, if it is and you're in the right place, uh, get comfortable. And as your eyes begin to close, take that one conscious deep breath. And as you release, follow it with the second. Deep breath to that place of inner peace. <sighs> Doing it twice and take yourself to paradise. This is a practice to feel safe and relaxed. There's a certain irony in having a new experience, any new experience, even one of being safe and relaxed, generates a little anxiety. What an irony. And so you simply take another slow, deep breath. Do it now. Hold for a moment and then breathe right into that question. Am I really safe? Is it really okay? Ah, yeah, feel it. Make a deal with yourself if your mind obsesses and says, this is not a good idea, this is new and feels sort of dangerous. I don't know. What if something sneaks up on us? Take another slow, deep breath and instruct the mind. You're the higher self, you see. The mind works for you. Remind it, you're safe. It's okay. In fact... As you come to this place of narrow awake, you are more alert and more aware. And as you continue to breathe deeply, your mind becomes convinced that you are safe. It has no other choice. As you breathe deeply, any danger in the voice dissipates fades away. As you breathe deeply, only the feelings of being safe can stay. And once you're safe, you're really sure. You're feeling safe and so secure. Then your mind is safe in this place of narrow awake to explore opportunities, possibilities, without fear of mistakes. There's no danger here. Whatever you explore, imagining being different, imagining being more, there's room for all of that, feeling safe inside. And knowing 
you're growing brings a feeling of pride. Knowing you're growing brings a feeling of pride. So enter this state of paradise with a deep breath or do it twice. More if you need. It's not about speed. It's about release and letting go. And in this state of narrow awake, the higher self-consciousness will flow. And you feel safe to go where only you can go. A microscope, a telescope, a camera, a pair of binoculars, all can be focused. They have a variable adjustment there to help you focus for the most clear image. Exactly the same thing is going on with your awareness, with your mental and emotional nature, and more important to the higher self we find in paradise, the somewhat detached, not dissociated, but detached higher self that can then make better judgments about the thoughts rather than simply be the thought. The focus of narrow awake allows us to make better judgments and to understand with enhanced sensitivity our emotional nature as well. And certainly then, we think before we act. We look before we leap and make much better decisions in what we say and the things that we do. Our overall behavior tends to be not only in our interest to a larger degree, but for the greater good of all concerned. When awareness is focused, crisp and clear, in narrow awake, so imagine a situation when you are wide awake, someone or something that pushes your buttons and makes you strongly, emotionally charged. But now imagine you're choosing instead to experience that in a state of narrow awake, that experience that in the past would have caused you irritation now causes you to recall it's time to take a deep breath, focus the mind. Step back, detach, see what you find. It'll be different. It'll be quite different, you'll see. From that higher perspective, it's a different reality. So imagine right now something that in the future would likely occur. I mean, something that's probably going to happen. You don't have to be absolutely sure, but someone you know or something you know that's always bothered you before. But this time, see yourself move into that narrow awake place and see a different outcome in store. Imagine it ending differently as you take that deep breath. Imagine a new outcome. The best you can expect. And then bring to bear the passion, the focused passion. If the image of your goal or solution is the energy, the passion is the force or the push behind it. It's the drive. Or some see it the other way, as the magnetic pull. But it's, in either case, a force, like an electromagnetic force. So remember the passion. There are such things as using contemplation and meditation to be without thought and free from passion. This is an opportunity, however, in the most focused way to bring your clearest intelligence and your most focused love into creating a goal, a solution, a desired result that is for the greatest good of all concerned. Do this not only for you, but for the greater and highest good of everybody involved. And you'll always get a nice outcome, a really good outcome, sometimes even better than what you expected. So, with the idea in mind that 
You have the power to return to this paradise place anytime you choose. Bring yourself back to the awareness of the room, back to the awareness of your body, and with one more deep breath, open your eyes and bring yourself back to wide awake. Back to wide awake, not quite so wide awake as you were, but a little more wide awake than the narrow awake state. Now, this narrow awake place, there's three really great uses that come to my mind. And, and just keep in mind that you can use it for an instant, for a moment, or for a while. Those are my three uses. The instant is, I want to take this, uh, whatever it is going on in my life, and I want to stop and detach. I want to take a deep breath, and I want to just see that I have other choices. I want to get out of the autopilot. I don't want to knee jerk. I want to just take one breath and just become conscious. That's one, you know, in an instant use of the narrow awake state. The other is for moments where I want to imagine something true or I want to ask myself a question and listen for the answer. It's, it's, I've got a purpose in mind. I go in and I say it and I listen or I say it and program it and visualize it. Imagine what I want as if I've already got it over and over with great passion and then I get out and that takes moments. And then the, the time that I use it for a while is when I just close my eyes, go to my peaceful place and say, okay, let's see what happens now. And that's when some of the most wonderful creative ideas pop into my brain. So for an instant, just to become conscious, for a moment to ask a question or to program a solution, and for a while to just explore the depths of who you really are. Before we conclude today, I want to thank you for being a contributor to FocusedPassion.com. I want to thank you for listening to this program. I want to thank you for telling folks about it. But most importantly, I want to thank you for using the Send One to a Friend tool that's on the Focused Passion site right there below the player that you use. You can listen to these programs, as many do, on your computer through a download to iTunes through an RSS reader built into your browser or the streaming player right there on our website. But in any event, you'll see that tool, share one with a friend, use it for a lot of reasons. If you're just listening as a contributor to these programs and getting all the benefit that you can out of it, that's great, but it's half of the story. The other half of our mission at FocusedPassion.com is to forward to people you know the best programs that they need to hear. We have a big variety of programs here, a whole catalog of personal and spiritual development programs, but you know the people that need this particular program or that particular program. So be sure and forward it as often as you want to as many people as you'd like anytime you feel like it for no charge whatsoever, okay? Please use that. That's how we change the world. That's certainly one important way is to provide solutions about how to find solutions. This is the solution to solutions. And there's nothing to join and no guru to follow. And it's totally inclusive. We honor all traditions and all beliefs. We're just focused on what works best. All right. Share that with your friends. And remember the Family Learning Hour, too. That five-part program Give it to your kids and your friends' kids. It's easy to do with that. Send one to a friend gadget right there on FocusedPassion.com. Send the people that you love the programs they most need to hear to solve their problems and to heal their hearts. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha. <laughs>